Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama.
Namaste Sarasati Devi Goravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschachadishatarine Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om 
namo bhagavate vasudevaya So we are continuing to recount the adventures of Dhruva Maharaj as described in the fourth canto Srimad Bhagavatam. So we heard how Dhruva Maharaj had been insulted by his stepmother Suruchi and he'd gone off to the forest. And on his way to the forest he met with Narada Muni and he took instruction from Narada Muni. Of course, Narada Muni tested him first, but then he took instruction. He, gave, he did give instruction. And then Dhruva Maharaj went into the forest, into Madhuvan, very special forest which is marked with the footprints of Lord Krishna, who had performed his pastimes there. Of course, footprints of Lord Krishna, they are eternally there in Madhuvan. Lord Krishna resides eternally in Vrindavan. Five thousand years, you may say Dhruva Maharaj appeared before Lord Krishna. Of course, Dhruva Maharaj is Satya Yuga and Lord Krishna comes at the end of the Dwapara Yuga. So there's millions of years difference. But Lord Krishna resides eternally in Vrindavan. Vrindavan is the Dham and the Dham means the place where the Lord is residing eternally. So the forest of Vrindavan is marked with the footprints of Lord Krishna. It's just that 5,000 years ago you could say Lord Krishna became prakat, he became manifest, whereas in the times of Dhruva Maharaj he's there, but in aprakat form. All right, so Dhruva Maharaj is residing in Madhuvan and he's performing his tapasya. First thing to do, very first thing, which we should all do in the practice of devotional service, to fix our mind on the Lord, that we're doing this for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. So Dhruva Maharaj fixed his mind on the Supreme Lord completely gave up any thought of any kind of sense gratification and he was residing in Madhuvan on the banks of the Kalindi or the Yamuna river. And first three days, well, in addition to chanting his mantra and worshipping form of the Lord, he was also doing some tapasya. He would fix his mind by doing pranayama, by doing this astanga yoga which involves pranayama and then bringing the mind under control, focusing the mind on the form of the Lord. And beautiful descriptions are given there in the Srimad Bhagavatam of the form of the Lord. You can read also in the third canto, Lord Kapila's Shiksha, to Devahuti is describing how to meditate on the super soul, how you meditate first of all on the overall features of the Lord, and then you focus on the different limbs of the Lord, beginning from his lotus feet and progress upwards to the face of the Lord. And of course, studying Srimad Bhagavatam is not different from meditating on the form of the Lord. The first two cantos of the Srimad Bhagavatam are the Pad Pada Padma, the lotus feet of the Lord, and the tenth canto is the face of the Lord. So we progress through the cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam to the lotus face. In the same way, we meditate first from the Lord's lotus feet up to observe the lotus face. So Dhruva Maharaj was doing this and then for the first three days, for the first month, every three days he would eat some fruit from a tree. Srila Prabhupada remarks that particular fruit is never usually eaten by human beings. It's not very suitable 
for human beings, but the monkeys will sometimes eat it. So Dhruva Maharaj was eating this particular fruit, not every day, but just once in three days. And then the second month, he stopped eating the fruits and he was just eating some dry leaves and grasses which were growing around there in the forest. And he was doing that only every six days. And then the third month, he stopped eating the leaves and grass and he was just taking some water once every nine days. So he was really doing great austerities. While only a young boy of five years old, he was really controlling his tongue and his mind and senses. He was very focused, he was very fixed. So then the fourth month, he stopped drinking water and he began to regulate his breathing. And he was not breathing regularly. He was just taking a breath of air. He fully controlled the breathing process. And then in the fifth month, he was so fixed in his meditation on the form of the Lord that the Lord became fully in, in his heart. And he was able to stand on one leg, standing on one leg and at the same time meditating on the form of the Lord. And sometimes also he would be chanting the mantra which had been given to him by Narada Muni, the twelfth syllable mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And in this way, because he was controlling his breathing, the whole three worlds all began to suffocate and all the different inhabitants in the three worlds were in danger. They thought, we're going to die, we can't breathe, we're not able to get air. Dhruva Maharaj's austerity was so great that because he was controlling his breath and restricting his breathing, it restricted the universal breathe, breathing. All the people in the universe were not able to breathe. And he became so heavy because he was meditating on the Lord and the Lord was fully in his heart. He was meditating on the Lord so, and standing on one leg that his big toe pushed the earth down. His big toe pushed the whole earth down and everything, every, the whole earth planet began to tremble. So at that point, all the different demigods, they went to Lord Vishnu to ask for help. They were in fear of their lives. They thought the world is coming to an end. We're all going to die. We're suffocating. But Lord Vishnu is omniscient and he told them, it's all right, I know what's wrong. This is caused by the austerities of Dhruva Maharaj. Don't worry, go back to your abodes and I will go there and see Dhruva Maharaj myself and take care of the situation. Don't you worry, everything will be restored. So the Lord then went to Madhuvan and appeared in front of Dhruva Maharaj. And when the Lord appeared in front of Dhruva Maharaj, then Dhruva Maharaj, of course, he offered his obeisances, he fell flat on the ground, did full dandabats, and then he sat up and the, the Lord put his lotus hand on his head, maybe put the conch shell, touched his conch shell, Lord, the Lord appeared in the forearm form, so one of the hands was carrying a conch shell. With that conch shell, he touched the head of Dhruva Maharaj and imparted into Dhruva Maharaj divine knowledge. So Dhruva Maharaj was then able to offer nice prayers to the Lord. 
and he glorified the Lord. All the wonderful energies, potencies of the Lord. How the Lord can perform so many amazing activities which cannot be understood by anyone except for his devotees. The only ones who can actually understand the Lord are the devotees. And Dhruva Maharaj went on to glorify the association of devotees. That association of devotees is so important for spiritual life. And Dhruva Maharaj was praising that in the association of devotees there will be discussion of the topic of Lord Krishna. Just as we are having here in our Goranga Hall regularly, there's always discussion on the topics of Lord Krishna. So Dhruva Maharaj was praising all of these different devotional activities and he went on also to describe the foolishness of materialistic people who may approach, approach the Lord for material means. Actually, we see this also in the case of Kardama Muni. Kardama Muni, who went on to become the husband of Devahuti, Kardama Muni had been practicing brahmacharya life for 10,000 years. 10,000 years because Satya Yuga, in Satya Yuga people lived 100,000 years. So he spent some 10,000 years doing his meditation and then the Lord appeared to him. And the Lord told Kardama, well Kardama Muni, when the Lord appeared to Kardama Muni, then Kardama Muni then offered prayers to the Lord. He offered his prayers to, to the Lord. And at that time, Kardama Muni also described how materialistic people may worship the Lord to get material things. And he described them as being foolish, that they could get something more, something better from the Lord. And we see this also in the case of Dhruva Maharaj that Dhruva Maharaj has also approached the Lord and he has been approaching the Lord. His motivation in coming to Madhuvan was that he wants a kingdom. He wants to get an empire for himself greater than even Lord Brahma, who is his great-grandfather. So, we often find these kind of things, ambitions in young children. You know, when children are very young, they will say, I want to do this, I want to do that, you know. They have, we, you know, when you're, we're children, we often have some kind of ambitions of what we would like to do, what we would like to achieve. So, we see also with Dhruva Maharaj, that as a young child, he had this desire, but his desire was very, very strong and therefore he is, he, he has approached the Lord to fulfill his desires. Of course, he was instructed by his mother that you have to, you have to find the Lord, you have to take shelter, get the mercy of the Lord, he can fulfill your desire. So in this way, Dhruva Maharaj had gone to the forest, he'd done austerities for six months, and then the Lord had appeared to him. And the, the Lord listens to the prayers of Dhruva Maharaj, and then the Lord tells to Dhruva Maharaj that, yes, I've arranged everything for you. You're going to get all your desires fulfilled. And the Lord tells Dhruva Maharaj that there's a special planet for you. You're going to get a planet where nobody else goes, 
even Lord Brahma can't go to this planet, this planet being the pole star. When we look up at the sky, you, we can see the pole star. It's very prominent in the sky. And all the planets, all the planets of the seven rishis and everything, they're all rotating around the pole star. So that pole star, that became Dhruva Loka. Dhruva Maharaj was given that planet to reside there. And on that planet is also Sweta Dweep, where Lord Shirodakashai Vishnu resides. Lord Shirodakashai Vishnu being the super soul in the hearts of all living entities, but he also has his abode there in Sweta Dweep. Sweta Dweep being, Dweep means an island. So it's an island in the middle of the milk ocean. And Lord Shirodakashaya Vishnu resides there. So that place is so, that place is actually the spiritual world. You can understand Lord Vishnu is residing there. It's not an ordinary place. It's the spiritual world. Just like the Kajyo Ocean is also spiritual because Lord Vishnu is there. So, uh, Dhruva Maharaj was told by the Lord that he is going to go there, that he wanted to have a kingdom greater than Lord Brahma, so the Lord is going to give him his desire, he's going to fulfill his desire. He will go there to that planet, the pole star, and he is residing there today. He is residing there on the pole star, Dhruva Loka. But the Lord also told him, you will also become the king. You will take your father's throne. Your father, Uttanapada, he's going to retire. He's going to enter the forest to take Manapras, and you will become the next king. And you will rule the world for 36,000 years. Because Satya Yuga, right? So 36,000 years he would rule the world. So Dhruva Maharaj was, he had seen the Lord, he would offered his obeisances and he would offered his prayers to the Lord. And now he's heard from the Lord everything. The Lord also went on to tell him more. He went to tell, he, the Lord told him about his brother, that your brother Uttama, it's going to be killed by some yaksha. And your mother will, your stepmother, Saruchi, will also perish. So Dhruva Maharaj heard all of these things from the Lord. And after hearing everything from the Lord himself, then Dhruva Maharaj feels very despondent. He feels very discouraged because he can understand he had made a great mistake. What mistake had he made? Well, the mistake was that he had asked for something material. He had approached the Lord. His motivation was to get the kingdom. His motivation wasn't to get moksha, it wasn't to get pure devotion, it wasn't for service. His motivation was, I want a kingdom. Just wanted to get something from the Lord. So that is not the mood of pure devotion. So Dhruva Maharaj greatly lamented this fact that he had been so foolish to approach the Lord just to ask for a kingdom, a perishable kingdom in this material world. And he compares it to just, just like if you go to an emperor, 
somebody who is at the emperor with a great empire and you ask him, please give me some pieces of broken rice. Is that very intelligent? Are you going, if you meet such a great man who is an emperor, you're going to ask him, give me some broken rice? So Dhruva Maharaj regretted that his, his behavior was like that, that he had approached the Lord just to get something material. And this is why he was very despondent. Although, in many ways, everything he desired had been achieved. He wanted to get the kingdom, and the Lord told him, you'll get it. And he wanted some revenge. He had some, he had some revenge, he wanted revenge in his heart, because he had been insulted by his stepmother. So the Lord told him how his stepmother, she's going to perish, she's going to die. So everything which, and, and then also his brother, the, bro the other brother who was the son of Suruchi, who was like his stepbrother, he's also going to be killed. So in some ways everything which was at the obstacles to Dhruva becoming the king, they'd all been removed. And now Dhruva is going to get the kingdom, he's going to become the king because his brother is going to be killed and his stepmother won't be there. And this way there will be nobody else to oppose Dhruva sitting on the throne and becoming the king in place of his father. But it didn't make him happy. Dhruva Maharaj regrets that he was so foolish to want to get this kingdom. He said, he Dhruva Maharaj himself, it's described in Padma Purana, that Dhruva Maharaj said, I went to the forest like a person looking for pieces of broken glass. And instead, I have found the most beautiful jewel. And then Dhruva Maharaj said, Swamin Kritatosmi Varam Nayachi. Now I am fully satisfied. Dhruva Maharaj said, Now I don't need anything more. I have everything. What did he have? The Lord had come. The Lord had appeared to him. So he had blessed. Sorry, I took it my body. The Lord had appeared to bless. Dhruva Maharaj by his presence. So this was, we would think this would be pleasing to Dhruva Maharaj, that the Lord has come to him, he's found the Supreme Lord, and his, everybody who was opposing him, they're, being, they're going to die, they're being removed, and he's going to get his desire, he's going to become the king, not only is he going to become the king and get his father's kingdom, but he's going to go on to go to the pole star. And on the pole star, the Lord told him, your sin, you will reside there eternally. And he says, when you become the king, you'll rule, you'll rule the world for 36,000 years. Your senses, the power of your senses will not weaken and you won't grow old. So that's a very wonderful thing, you know. <laughs> 36,000, just to be 36 years, you grow old, but 36,000 years without aging, that was the benediction given to Dhruva Maharaj, that he could live in that position. But he's not happy. It did not satisfy him. All the material things of the world cannot satisfy our lust. So, how is it possible that Dhruva Maharaj was not happy despite getting all of that benediction from the Lord? So that is discussed in the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Acharyas explain to us how Dhruva Maharaj 
was only sitting, that although he went to the forest, the Lord did not consider his motivation. The Lord only considered his service. That his motivation certainly was not pure. His motivation was to get the great kingdom. But everything he did by way of service, that was very exalted, very splendid. Great tapasya, controlling his mind and senses, fully absorbing himself, meditating on the form of the Lord and chanting also the mantra with the name of the Lord. And in this way, Dhruva Maharaj pleased the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He pleased him so much that the Lord was able to come before Dhruva Maharaj and give darshan to him. So that kind of service. And we see something similar by way of uh, the Lord not looking at the motivation, but looking only at the service. You see, for example, Putana. Now Putana was a great Rakshasi who came into Goku when Lord Krishna was in the home of Nanda Maharaj as a baby. And Putana is a powerful Rakshasi she could transform her body to make her body look like a young gopi. And she, she dressed herself just like a gopi. And she came there into Goku and everyone saw her and they all thought, oh, who is this gopi? Who is this? We never saw this gopi before. And she said, oh, my husband's a brahmana in Mathura. I've just come from Mathura, I've come to see the baby, I want to see the baby, I hear there's a baby just born, I just want to see the baby. So she entered into the home of Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, and everyone saw, oh, Gopi has come, and she's very beautiful, very attractive, and nobody stops her from entering and picking up baby Krishna. And she picks up baby Krishna and she wants to feed her breast to Krishna. Now, of course, Putana has put poison on her breast. And her motivation was to kill Krishna. But her mood was to be Krishna's mother. She picks up Krishna, she nurses him and puts her, the baby's mouth into her breast so that Krishna could bite on her breast. And of course, Krishna took out her life air, but at the same time, Lord Krishna noted her service, that she's coming, she wants to be my nurse. So Lord Krishna thought, let me take her to Goloka. And she went back to Godhead, to Goloka, to become a nurse in the spiritual world. In Goloka, the, the supreme abode of the Lord, she became Krishna's own nurse there. So that's an, another example where Lord Krishna simply sees the service. He doesn't see the motivation. Although the motivation of Putana was evil, that she wanted to kill baby Krishna, but she's coming, she's dressed like a gopi. So Krishna thought she wants to be a gopi. She's dressed like a gopi. And she's coming, she wants, she wants to be my nurse. So take her back, let her go back to Godhead. And so, of course, this was remarked by Uddhava, Aho bhakti yam sanakala kutam jagam sayapayanat apya sabi. Who could be more merciful than Lord Krishna? That he accepted this Rakshasi Putana who came with poison on her breast, but Lord Krishna took her to be his nurse in this, in this spiritual world. So similarly, you have Dhruva Maharaj. This Dhruva Maharaj, he's a devotee. 
but he had some material desires initially. Now, you see, you see when we approach Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna knows our motivation. He knows what we are thinking. Because Lord Krishna is situated in the heart of every living entity. So he is certainly aware of our own consciousness and our feelings and motivation. So he, can un he could understand Dhruva Maharaj's mentality. And that this Dhruva Maharaj, although he's only a child, he wants a kingdom. He wants to be a ruler. He wants a, not just any kingdom, he wants a kingdom greater than Brahma. So he can go to the pole star. Let him go there and reside there. And so in, in this way, Dhruva Maharaj, not only before he could go to the pole star, he first of all had to reside as a king for 36,000 years ruling the world. Now Srimad Bhagavatam goes on to describe what happened, how Dhruva Maharaj was ruling the world and initially uh, it happened that his, his brother Uttama had gone into the into the forest and somehow he'd been killed by a yaksha. Yakshas, the Srila Prabhupada said that sometimes the Tibetan people are thought to be the yakshas. The planets of the yakshas is actually higher than the earth planet and they have powers, they have magical powers. So Sometimes it's thought that Tibetan people are from the Yakshas. Anyway, the Dhruva Maharaj's brother, name was Uttama, he had gone there into the forest and he had an encounter, encounter with the Yakshas and he was killed. So when Dhruva Maharaj got news that his brother had been killed, then Dhruva Maharaj became very angry. And he went into the forest, he went to the, the city where the Yakshas all reside. And Srimad Bhagavatam describes how there was the kingdom of the Yakshas and their capital city. And Dhruva Maharaj went there and he fought with them all. And they had a huge battle and thousands of Yakshas were killed by Dhruva Maharaj. It was a great battle. And the Yakshas had also very many mystical powers. Just like if you read in the Krishna book, 10th Canto, you can read about Salva, how Salva attacked Dwarka. Salva had been a friend of Sishupal. And he had gone to Sishupal, he, he had gone to attend Sishupala's wedding. He thought Sishupala was going to marry Rukmini. But of course Lord Krishna had come there and he kidnapped Rukmini before Sishupala could marry her. So Salva was one of the friends of Sishupala who had come there to attend the marriage. So Salva was very angry that Sishupala was not able to marry Rukmini. And then later on, Maharaj Yudhisthira had performed the Rajasuya sacrifice and at that time Sishupal had been killed by Lord Krishna. Sishupal had been very insulting and he did many atrocities and Lord Krishna killed him. So Salva was the friend of Sishupal and he came to attack Dwarka. Initially when Salva came to attack Dwarka, Lord Krishna was not present. Lord Krishna had gone to Hastinapur to be with, to be with the Pandavas. But when, and in his absence, 
Prajumna, who is the eldest son of Lord Krishna by Rukmini, Prajumna, along with his other brothers like Samba, they had all fought against Salva and his army. Uh, this Salva was a very powerful demon. It because he had been given, he'd done great tapasya and he got blessings from a demon named Maya. He asked the demon to give him an aeroplane which could fly, which could become invisible. So Salva had this magical aeroplane which could appear and disappear, sometimes in the air, sometimes on the land. And like this, Salva was attack, attacking Dwarka and fighting and killing people in Dwarka. And Prajumna and the other brothers, sons of Krishna, they all came out to fight Salva. And then Krishna got news. He was in Hastinapur, so he immediately came back from Hastinapur and he went to fight with Salva. So in the course of fighting, Lord Krishna had struck Salva and then Salva understood that Lord Krishna was very powerful. He began to use his, Salva began to use mystical powers and he made himself invisible. And then he arranged for some person to appear, a person who nobody knew. Nobody had seen this person before. And the person said, I've just come from Lord Krishna. I've just come from Dwarka. I have to tell Lord, I have to tell Krishna that his father, Vasudev, has been arrested. He's been taken prisoner by Salva. His life is in danger. So nobody had seen this person before, but he was giving this information to Krishna. And then it happened that Salva appeared in his aeroplane and he was, he held his, around the neck, he held a person who looked just like Vasudev, just like Krishna's own father. And then Salva took a knife and he cut off the head of this person who looked just like Krishna's father. And when Lord Krishna saw his father beheaded, Lord Krishna was, of course, very disturbed. But then he controlled his mind and he remembered that he'd already put Lord Balaram in Dwarka to protect everyone there. And he, he thought, Lord Balaram is invincible. How could anyone ever go there and capture my father in the presence of Lord Balaram? So he understood this must be some trick. But this is the kind of powers which some people have. They can do these kind of magic tricks. So similarly, when the Yakshas were fighting with Dhruva Maharaj, they were using a lot of mystic powers and meteors were falling from the sky. All kinds of weapons were hailing down on Dhruva Maharaj. And Dhruva Maharaj, for a moment, sometimes he would become bewildered and then he would remember the Supreme Lord. And as soon as he would remember the Lord, then immediately all the Maya would be removed. As we say, Krishna Suryasam Maya Haya Andika. Yahan Krishna Tahannahi Mayaya Adika. Krishna is like the sun and Maya is like darkness. In the presence of the sun, there can be no maya. So in this way, Dhruva Maharaj countered all the mystic powers of the yakshas and was able to defeat them. So Dhruva Maharaj was fighting and it was a great battle and so many people were dying. But then Swayambhuva Manu appeared. And Swayambhuva Manu is the grandfather of Dhruva Maharaj. And he came to instruct Dhruva Maharaj. And he explained to Dhruva Maharaj that this anger is not proper. Now, we have to understand that 
there is proper use of anger. In some ways, some anger was necessary because Dhruva Maharaj was the king. He was ruling the kingdom and his brother had been killed. So it was his duty to take some action against the culprits. If he doesn't take any action, then it's not very good because the violence has been committed. So he should take some action, he should do something about it. If he doesn't do anything about it, then it encourages in the future there will be more violence. So as the ruler, it was his duty to do something about it. However, Dhruva Maharaj went overboard. He did, he done too much. And that's why Swayambhuvamanu came to him. And Swayambhuvamanu explains to Dhruva Maharaj that, you know, your brother was killed by one yaksha, but you're killing thousands of yakshas. One person killed your brother, but you're not, you're not taking action against one person. You're killing so many people in revenge for your brother. So in this way, Swayam Bhuva Manu requested Dhruva Maharaj to give up his anger and not to continue to go, go ahead with all of this killing, wholesale killing. Violence is not something which devotees want to take pleasure in, but sometimes it is necessary. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna, he's, Arjuna is also thinking that he should not fight. But Lord Krishna explains to Arjuna different reasons why he should fight. He explains that, you know, that the soul never dies, only the body dies. And karma, sinful reactions, well, if you do it as a duty, there's no reaction. If you're performing karma yoga, then there's no reaction. And degradation of the society, de unwanted population. Krishna said, if you don't fight, if you don't act, that will be the cause of unwanted population. Sinful reactions, no, no sinful reactions because you're doing it in karma yoga. You won't enjoy, no, you will enjoy. If you don't fight, you'll be a coward, you'll be ridiculed, your name will be ruined and people will scorn you. If, but if you do fight, either you will win the kingdom and enjoy the kingdom or else if you're killed in the battlefield, then you will go to heaven or somewhere. So, Kshatriya either dies on the battlefield or wins the battle. But he doesn't go home defeated. And so that's the principle in Kshatriya codes. So, in the same way Manu Samhita says, murderers should be killed. That it is very bad, someone's a murderer and they're not killed by the state, then they will suffer for, they will suffer much more in the future life for their sins. So it's better that they're given capital punishment. Capital punishment should be enforced. That's better for the murderers. Sometimes the state will also use violence to restore law and order in the kingdom. If there's a lot of unrest and disturbance in the country, then the state has to take action to preserve law and order. So in this way, there is proper use of violence. However, Dhruva Maharaj had gone over the limit. He's used, he'd used more violence than was actually necessary. So Swayambhuva Manu came to him to request him to refrain from all of this violence and be peaceful. And Dhruva Maharaj was obedient to his grandfather. Dhruva Maharaj ruled the world for 36,000 years. 
perform many sacrifices for the pleasure of the Lord. Performing sacrifices. In the Satya Yuga, of course, the process in the Satya Yuga was meditation, but sacrifices were also performed by the great king. And Dhruva Maharaj, as a king, he would perform wonderful sacrifices. And at that time also, he would give charity because he's the king. So he's, a, he's receiving taxes from everyone. So with the taxes, he's able to reward people and to provide for the needy people. In Satya Yuga, everyone is Paramahamsa. Everyone has good qualities, pious, religious. And Dhruva Maharaj was the king. So he's got that he's got the benefit of ruling at that time when there's not many sinful activities. To become a king means to take one sixth of the karma of the state. A very unfortunate situation for leaders today because in countries today you see there's a lot of cow killing a lot of unnecessary violence so many abortions and so many things going on and the rulers they have to take one sixth of the karma for all of these sinful activities just like in Srila Prabhupada's time there was one uh, president of the USA. I forget his name now, but anyway, he was a cattle rancher. You know, politicians have to be wealthy people. So this, this one who had, this particular man who had become the president, he was a cattle rancher. He raised cow, he raised cattle for, for slaughter. So when he became the, pre the president of the USA, at that time, the USA was engaged in war with Vietnam. And the whole time he was the, pre the president there, the Americans were fighting in Vietnam. Now every day on this man's farm, he was having many cattle killed. So every day, his soldiers were fighting in Vietnam and being killed. It was like reactions for his sins because he was killing his mother in the form of the cows. So his children were being killed. His soldiers of his, the army there, they were all being killed in Vietnam. This, the law of karma is like that. You cannot escape. You do violence, you get violence back. So Manu instructed Dhruva Maharaj, refrain from that violence. Be peaceful. Don't take any more unnecessary action. And the other mother, Suruchi, who was the mother of Uttama, when she heard that her son had died, had been killed by a yaksha, she was so much attached, she was so much concerned for her son, she went into the forest to look for him, calling out for her son, Uttama, Uttama. And she called, as she wandered in the forest, somehow there was a forest fire arose and she, was burnt. she gave up her life in a forest fire. And this way she left the world. And so Dhruva Maharaj was left with his own mother, Suniti. Maharaj Uttanapada, he was initially very worried that where's my son gone? My son he was so worried. When he realized his son had gone off to the forest, he was lamenting that my son has gone away. I have no idea where he's gone, when he'll come back. Will he be able to survive in the forest? Maybe he will lay down, on, he'll be tired, he'll lay down on the ground in the forest. The animals will come and eat him. He'll be devoured. And he was thinking like that. 
But then Narada Muni, Narada Muni came to him and told him, and, well, first of all, Narada says to him, well, what's wrong? You look, your face is all withered and dried up. What's the problem? And then he, he explained, he said, I'm so worried about my son. He said, I was controlled by my wife. I was a dancing dog in the hands of my young wife. And I neglected my other wife and, my, and her son, and they've gone off, they've left me, and I, I'm not taking care of them. He felt, but Narada Muni told me, you don't have to worry. Your son has become a great soul. He's become a great, great personality. Although he's only a child, everyone in the universe knows about him now. He's so exalted. Such a great personality. So he's made your name famous by his activities. And so it happened. After six months, the message came that Dhruva Maharaj is coming back to the kingdom. And they all went out to meet Dhruva Maharaj. Everyone went. The Maharaj, Maharaj Uttanapada went out on his chariot and he brought his two wives with him. And he brought Dhruva Maharaj's brother also. They all came to receive Dhruva Maharaj. And many brahmanas and the, everything was auspicious. They were chanting Vedic hymns and blowing bugles, all welcoming Dhruva Maharaj back to the kingdom. They were so happy that he had come back. And he had come back as a great soul fully enlightened and fully realized in knowledge by the grace of the Lord. So in this way, uh, uh, this way Maharaj Uttanapada was very happy and after some time he saw his son progressing. He thought, now my son is, he can become the king. Yeah. The, the, the son is already capable to do everything. We shouldn't hang on to positions. We should give up, posi we should always be willing to bring others up to take responsibilities. Don't try to hang on to keep our positions ourselves. We should always be willing to give way for new people to come forward, to come up. We see Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada began the movement but Srila Prabhupada didn't take the full control. Srila Prabhupada immediately he established the GBC, he got the leaders, and he said, now you manage the society. And Prabhupada would just check up from time to time what they were doing and how they were managing. And so this is proper leader, this is how it should be, you know. As we get an older, as you become more, you want to give up the responsibility. The Vedic culture is like that. You don't hold on, hands on, you know, 98 years old and I want to be the Prime Minister, you know, that's not, <laughs> that's not quite the way it's supposed to be, you know. The, the, the Vedic culture is something different, you know, the people are supposed to retire. And the purpose of retirement, to take up spiritual activities, right? Mahavishnu Goswami used to say, if the family are asking you, when are you going? <laughs> when are you leaving home? It's not very good. They sh they should, if they say, where did he go? That's good. But if they say, when are you going? <laughs> it's not very good. Okay, thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, you know, Dhruv, Dhruv Maharaj had very, his desire was very strong. Like, we also have multiple, multiple varieties of desire. But at least from a spiritual perspective, how will we how will we make our desire strong? How will we make our desire strong from a spiritual perspective? Yes. Well, we have to we have to cultivate. We have to know what is spiritual desire. Spiritual desires mean 
we want to progress in our Krishna consciousness, we want to become more active in our service to Krishna, we want to have more remembrance of Krishna. How to achieve that? Well, how to achieve anything in devotional service? Well, sadhana, by sadhana, that's the main thing. The foundation for all progress in spiritual life is our own sadhana, regular practice of hearing and chanting. We have to absorb ourselves regularly in coming to see the deities and offering obeisances and reciting prayers, all of these different activities, very important for us. And in this way, naturally, the desires will come more in our heart. The more we're absorbed in hearing and chanting and trying to serve Krishna, the more Krishna will reciprocate in our heart and direct us what we need to do to progress. Yes, sir. Well, I said Krishna resides eternally in the dawn, right? Mm -hmm. Eternally. So the, the forest of Vrindavan is it always marked with the lotus footprints of Krishna. Yeah, because you could also say the footprints are there from the previous Manu, from the previous time of... Well, Swambhuva Manu is the first Manu in this day of Brahma. But so from the previous day of <laughs> previous day of Brahma, you have to go back to another day of Brahma. So in one day of Brahma is fourteen man fourteen manus, right? Swambhuva Manu is the first one in this day of Brahma. So uh, now we're in the seventh manu, I think, by the Swata Manu. But uh, yeah, you could. You could you, it's in the middle of Lord Brahma's life. He's somewhere about 50 or 52 years old. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, incarnations, yeah. Many, many appearances of the Lord. And Vrindavan itself is a dam, so it's never actually annihilated. It's the holy dam, just like the, the Pope's star. It's never annihilated. So at the time of the devastation, at the time of the end of the universe, it simply becomes unmanifested. And then when the creation begins, then again it's manifest. So similarly also with the Dham, Vrindavan Dham, these places, they're never annihilated. They're not subject to time. So it's always the footprints of the Lord are always there. It's his own abode where he performs all of his pastimes. Yes. Yes, Prabhu. Sorry, so I was going to put this regarding the planetary system. So I understand from the lecture that Prashwet uh, Gunipa is on the pole star, Dhruva Loka, which is a spiritual planet. So I also understand, Maharaj, that uh, when, when there is something problem in the, in the material world and Brahmaji goes and prays to Lord Vishnu and on the banks of the, the sea of the ocean. So how come this material body, uh, they are able to enter the spiritual planet? Well, they don't, they don't actually enter into the planet. They, they, they cannot, Brahma doesn't enter into the planet. He's just at the shore of the milk ocean. He's not actually going to the planet. He cannot enter into the planet. He doesn't get to see Vishnu. He just has to meditate and wait for the message to come from Vishnu. So he's, it's like that. He's approaching by meditation, telecommunication. But he's not actually able to go there just to be on the shore of the milk ocean. It's not actually entering into the planet. 
Mm-hmm. That's it. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, what was your uh, strong inclination to be pulled into this Krishna consciousness? Well, I, I read the books. I read the book. And I was attracted by reading the book. I was looking. I was reading books about diff- books by other gurus. I read books by different people. A lot of different books, other people. And I thought Prabhupada's books made the most sense. I thought these are books which I can understand. The other books I read, I, I really didn't understand them. But I thought Prabhupada's books made sense to me. And I thought it was uh, very real. Any person who was also there to bring you in this way? Huh? Any particular person who was a strong inspiration for you, except Prabhupada? No, not really. And any like uh, worldly, like who were not uh, happy with something? Yes, of course. Many things <laughs> I was not happy with. The whole material world I wasn't happy with. Yeah, Please many. Name a few. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> name a few. Yeah. Not happy with my family situation, my economic situation, my education situation, my physical situation. Everything was horrible. Everything was a mess. The whole society was all disappointing. Uh, do we, can we call, uh, I mean, sometimes in a psychological terms, that Krishna consciousness is escapism? We escape from the material world in India? Yes, right. We escape. That's sense, common sense. Somebody comes in with a gun, you know, just like, you know, those people went to the Taj Mahal, you know, the terrorists came in the Taj Mahal with guns at Bombay one time. So what are you going to do? Are you going to sit there and wait and let them shoot you, or are you going to try and get out? You know, what should you do? The sensible thing is you're trying to escape. And so you look at the world and you see this world is just a horrible, horrible big mess. You think, how can I get out of it? How can I get out of that mess? Beautiful answer, Maharaj. Such a nice answer. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Chilla Prabhupada. Thank you so much, I have some dried fruit nuts. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Like to come and have some. Let's make it.